It's 8 p.m. and here are our top stories in 90 seconds. Winter isn't over just yet. In true Colorado fashion, Mother Nature is dumping snow across the state. Wet, heavy snow overnight, when temperatures might bounce back to the 60s. The shooting death of Dante Wright in Minnesota is sparking new conversations of police safety here in Colorado. Uh, it really uh, erodes trust and relationships with our community. So what is being done to prevent something similar in Denver? Uh, we want to avoid these mistakes, right? We don't want to focus and think that we got it all uh, figured out. We need to pay attention. Lovelet's police chief is responding to a lawsuit alleging excessive force used by his officers. Our police department uh, makes between 3,000 and 4,000 arrests per year. So if you look at uh, how often that occurs, it does not, uh, these complaints do not occur very often. Uh, when they do though, they are taken very seriously. Plus, ongoing reports of fraud within Colorado's unemployment claim system. Both employers and employees have been catching fraudulent claims since the late spring. And the iconic Casa Bonita restaurant in Lakewood could live to see another day. Casa Bonita is something that's just so close to Denver's hearts. So um, it's definitely an important place to stay open. We have a Denver 7 weather action day in effect right now as heavy wet snow is falling across Colorado. This is a live look at our crew driving along I-25 just south of Denver and the snow is falling heavily and it is icy out there. Good evening and thank you for watching Denver 7 News on Local 3. I'm Jessica Porter. We have team coverage for you tonight. Our near Genesee, where I-70 is just a mess right now. It is closed in both directions at the moment, but we start with Chief Meteorologist Mike Nelson. All right, thanks, Jessica. An April storm a month after we had the big March blizzard. So this is what it looked like this afternoon at City Park, but not for long as the rain came in and then the snow. And right now, downtown has already had several inches of snow, probably about two in the metro downtown, northwest Denver, closer to four inches of snow. Temperatures are falling below freezing now, so especially ramps and bridges will start to ice up. And it's a large swath of precipitation from the Continental Divide all the way out across northeast Colorado. Winter weather advisories cover all of northeastern Colorado from the divide all the way to Kansas, Nebraska until noon tomorrow. And you can see over the last Last couple of hours that moisture mostly shifting to all snow. The green is still some occasionally mixed precipitation, but that won't last long. We've had some thunder and lightning out there as well. So wet, heavy snow tonight with some thunder and lightning. Slushy roads expected and a wet, cold day on Friday. We're going to see some tough travel conditions out there. And for what's happening up into the foothills, let's go to Sloan Dickey. He's up in Genesee. Yeah, Mike, well, it's not just the snow totals. It's not actually very much snow, but it's the slick nature of the slow that snow that's coming down. That's making this so dangerous. If you look just behind me to my right, that's actually I 70 right now, and it's because nobody is actually traveling through this area that it looks pretty much like a graveyard. There's absolutely no traffic traveling. That's because the west and eastbound lanes have been closed. It's been quite a day. I mean, just three hours ago, it was just a little bit of snow, but we were driving back in the direction of Denver and we were we're seeing cars sliding out, lots of people stranded on the sides of the road. So I-70, definitely not an option you want to take this evening. We also spoke with CDOT officials about I-25 as the snow accumulates over the night and into tomorrow morning. It looks like the heaviest accumulations overnight with this particular snowstorm will be I-25 in the Monument Hill area. And if you travel that stretch, if you drive from Colorado Springs to Denver on a regular basis. You need to be very watchful of the weather. Pay attention to that. And she's not joking about that. That's because this is so slick at this point in time. We did see several emergency vehicles trying to make their way through the traffic, so it can turn into quite a dangerous situation, even with that one to two to three inches of snow that accumulate on the interstate. Back to you. Definitely looks rough out there. Thank you, Sloan. Make sure you turn over to Channel 7 tonight at 10 for the latest conditions on how your morning commute will be. And remember, you can find our 24-7 weather stream on Denver 7 News for your favorite streaming device. The death of Dante Wright at the hands of police in Minnesota has law enforcement here in Colorado taking notice. Denver 7's Eddie Guajardo sat down with Denver Police Chief Paul Pazin for how he plans to handle similar situations in his department. We're going to march together, we're going to march.
much as one. Arm in arm, last summer Denver Police Chief Paul Pazin marched with protesters. Like so many, demanding change after George Floyd died at the hands of police. We're all hurting. He promised that change and community safety. We are willing to stand with, to march with, and do the hard work that needs to take place for hey. police reform. Yeah. But on Sunday, that sense of security was shattered once again when 20-year-old Dante Wright was fatally shot by a Minnesota officer. It pains me. It, it, it pains our officers. Chief Payson says he shares the community's frustration. I share frustration. I share uh, dejection uh, when I see uh, the unnecessary trauma and uh, tragedies uh, that have occurred far too often uh, in our country. It is very much traumatizing. Ashira Campbell, a Black Lives Matter activist, is leading a rally on Saturday to give a voice to communities of color in light of the latest death. We're here to make sure that people's voices are being heard and to elaborate and to amplify that enough is enough and we are fed up with the police killing us. The shooting happened hundreds of miles away, but Dr. Anthony Young, a psychologist, says it's a reminder of the constant dangers people of color face. Because their cultural experience resembles that of the person who was murdered. We realize that this could happen to any one of us at any time. And Chief Payson knows change is needed, so it doesn't happen here in Colorado. It really uh, erodes trust and relationships with our community. Since the Black Lives Matter protests over the summer, the Denver Police Department banned the carotid chokehold. It now requires police officers to file reports in a timely manner when they display a weapon and increased officer training to help officers better assess situations, including crowd control. Chief Payson also points to policy changes to prevent repeating mistakes made by other departments. We want to avoid these mistakes, right? We don't want to focus and think that we got it all uh, figured out. We need to pay attention. He says it's vital for the community and the police department to communicate to lead to solutions. Uh, peaceful uh, protests we 100 percent uh, support. And actions on behalf of his department. If we respond, if we uh, treat that person with respect and dignity, if uh, their case is handled professionally, then that helps to uh, build trust. Now, Chief Pazin tells me his officers are currently going through taser training. In the Minnesota shooting video, you hear the officer yell taser and then fire off her gun. We also asked Chief Pazin about d diversity in the department. He tells us his officers either grew up in the communities that they serve or live in those communities, but says they're always welcome and open to improving. He hopes to bring more women onto the department as well, and they're currently hiring. Reporting live in Denver, Addy Guajardo, Denver 7. Addie, thank you. A Loveland police officer is on leave and two others are on desk duty following the release of a video in which a 73 year old woman is violently detained. Attorneys say that woman has dementia and did not understand why she was being stopped. The responding officer didn't seem to pick up on that in the way he spoke to her, brought her to the ground and allegedly dislocated her shoulder. The officers called for backup were no more sympathetic. We asked the chief of police today if procedures should be changed. Policing is, uh, is a complicated uh, profession. It is a dynamic profession. Every situation is different. We have to always assess and reassess when we have incidents, when we have complaints, to make a determination, uh, could we have done it differently? Uh, to answer your question right now would be very preliminary. Loveland police said they had not received any reports that the woman was injured until the lawsuit was filed yesterday in federal court. The department expects an investigation will take some time. The Karen Garner case in Loveland is much different from others we've discussed in the past. Set aside Garner's age, her size and gender, her illness, dementia can be difficult to spot if you don't know the signs, including memory loss and difficulty communicating with people. Most police officers are not equipped to handle that. Here is Denver 7's Lance Hernandez. I'm brought home. No, you're not. I think what, what is disturbing in the video is you see the officer kind of immediately 
treat her like enemy number one. CU Law Professor Aya Gruber says this video shows an utter lack of compassion and human feeling. She thinks police overreacted and used too much force on an 80-pound woman with dementia. But national use of force expert Ed Obayashi says the officers acted the way they were trained. She did not want to stop. The officer merely, as in uh, countless times um, in these in incidents, reached out to grab her, she pulled away. He says there was no indication Karen Garner suffered from mental illness. I asked if officers need more training on how to deal with people experiencing dementia or any other not readily apparent mental health issue. He says training is preferred, but there are limitations. There are trained medical professionals that go through years of dedicated training. Um, you, you, you can't expect an officer to uh, be put through the same level of intense discipline, uh, you know, that is not their primary role. What about excessive force? I think the force they used was absolutely excessive to the nature of the charges, the nature of the suspect, the unarmed suspect. And then, you know, when you put on top of it kind of this very dis dismissive and demeaning attitude. Garner apparently suffered a broken arm, dislocated shoulder, and sprained wrist. Does that indicate that there was excessive force used? An otherwise reasonable use of force can inadvertently result in an injury that was not intended. Obiashi says the angle of limbs, frailty, and pre-existing conditions come into play. Regardless of the outcome of situations like this, there is no question police are under a microscope like never before. Lance Hernandez, Denver 7. We've put together a statewide task force, getting cooperation from all the district attorneys. Colorado was working to put an end to unemployment claim fraud. We've only paid out $6.5 million on claims that are uh, confirmed as fraudulent. We do unfortunately expect that that number will be increasing. We look into why it's taking so long to find fraudsters. Heavy wet snow overnight. What kind of roads to expect tomorrow morning? Plus, the legendary Casa Bonita restaurant is working to open its doors in the near future. It affects everyone. It affects the, the employees. It affects our vendors, our customers, uh, everybody.